Joining me now to discuss all of this, nuclear expert Joe Srincione of the Plowshares Fund and ABC's Jake Tapper and Martha Raditz. Let me start with you first, Mr. Srincione. How bad is this nuclear meltdown, for want of a better word, and the fears that there may be another explosion here at one of the reactors? This is already one of the worst nuclear accidents in history if it stops right now. And we're dealing with multiple meltdown possibilities. At reactor number one, at reactor number two at the Diachi site, there's also concern about reactors at the Diani site. There are actually incidents at other uh, nuclear facilities in Japan that would have been significant incidents of them by themselves, but they're caught in the wake of these major crises at these nuclear reactors uh, that possibly will melt down in the next couple of days. Jake, how worried is the U.S. administration that this could reach the United States? As of now, uh, the concerns are minor. Uh, that this will reach uh, even Guam or the Marianas Islands or Hawaii, uh, the Gulf uh, or the shores off of Alaska or the West Coast. There, there's very minor concern uh, because there has not been a major release as of now. But administration officials uh, are, of course, concerned uh, in general about the potential uh, for the spreading of radioactive material. And that's why uh, they've sent a whole n a number of experts uh, to the region to monitor the situation, to help the Japanese, of course, but also to get our own information firsthand. And Martha, talking about information, there's been this feeling that perhaps the Japanese government has been playing it down, even though they've been on television almost every hour giving briefings. Take us back to Friday and how this all played out. Well, well Christian, literally right after the earthquake and the tsunami, I was talking to U.S. officials and they were saying the Japanese are playing this down. They are very, very nervous about what's happening at the nuclear plant, but they weren't really talking to U.S. officials. It was sort of one-way communication. Uh, the U.S. was offering help. They were offering immediate help to get nuclear teams in there, and the Japanese were resisting that. So that was a real frustration in the beginning. I think that frustration remains somewhat because they have a lot of people who could go in and help immediately. Obviously, this facility facility could not withstand that earthquake. So you have to wonder going forward, are they really ready for what may happen next? Mm -hmm. Now, Mrs. Serencioni, we know that at least three people have been treated for radiation sickness inside the plant, according to the government. Can you explain how these fail-safe measures actually failed? What happened that did not make sure that this nuclear reactor, this facility, shut down safely? Sure. Nuclear reactors are built to withstand crises uh, and even multiple crises. But it's very hard to build a facility that can withstand this. This was a one-two punch. First, the earthquake knocked out the electrical supply to these reactors, and then the tsunami came in and knocked out the backup electrical supply. So for the last few days, they've been running on battery uh, power, rushing to reestablish electri ele electric power to the plants, to the pumps that keep the water around the core and keep it cool. As those pumps lost the ability to do that, the core was exposed. We have at least half the core exposed at reactor number one at Daiichi. This led to the radiation exposure. No amount of radiation exposure is good for those workers scrambling to get these reactors under control. Mm -hmm. It could be fatal. Mm -hmm. And Jake, they've already said that they filled those damaged reactors with salt water, which basically means they've given up on them. They're not going to work anymore. How much confidence does the United States have in its counterparts here in the nuclear facilities, in the nuclear agencies? Well, if this crisis had happened here in the U.S., the U.S. government would be turning to Japan for help. These are the top people in the field. That said, uh, these are government officials, uh, and it has been pointed out it's not always true that the first things you're hearing from government officials are the accurate information. It's often optimistic. Uh, they don't want to have a panic. Uh, and so the administration is confident, but I think they have their eyes wide open, that not all the information they're getting uh, might be the worst case scenario, might always be the best case scenario. And Martha, we know that these kinds of things always affect uh, the idea of using nuclear power for, for energy. 
What effect do you think this will have on, on many people's desire to actually increase the use of nuclear power? I, I think it'll have a huge effect, and that's sort of something that you haven't heard very much talked about yet. We're dealing with the crisis now, but I spoke to a, a senior administration official last night, and they said that's one of the major concerns, how this will affect nuclear power in the future. I think there were already demonstrations in Germany. I think you'll see here in the U.S. We will surely take a look at our nuclear facilities and, and have Japan as a, as a bad model there on what can happen that you haven't planned for. Martha Raditz, Jake Tapper and Joe Serincioni, thank you all so much for joining me.